Before I begin our lecture on chapters four and five, I want you to take a few minutes to Google Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, here's her name. You've probably heard of her. Uh, I have the picture of her up here, as you can see. Uh, she is one of the most important Supreme Court justices we've had in the history of our country. And I think it is uh, worthwhile for you, whatever class you're in, to take a few minutes to explore what this woman means to our country, whether you're conservative or liberal. And one of the things to keep note of in the Supreme Court is that all of the justices either lean to the left or lean to the right, but they're all extremely qualified and competent jurists of one sort or another. And no matter what stripe politically people have had, they have all acknowledged that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of the more competent and professional and expert legal authorities in our country, even if they disagreed with her. And uh, among her closest friends were people such as Rehnquist and Scalia, who were on the right wing side of the court. And yet they found working accommodations and working relationships that were really profoundly interesting. Our country will be less for not having Ruth Bader Ginsburg still with us. Hopefully there will be others who will take up the leadership role that she is leaving behind. The court is at its best when there are arguments on all sides of the issues. If everyone thinks the same way, we have a lesser judicial experience in this country. And so she has been the leading dissent for quite a while because the court is predominantly conservative. She is so important that sometimes when she would write a dissent, and that is an important portion of the court's duty, it would lead Congress and sometimes even presidential administrations to change the law because the other side would say, well, this is the law we're applying it, and it would be her dissent that would prompt people to say, well, maybe the law shouldn't be that way. And she was doing that before she was on the court, and hopefully her spirit will survive. So I hope that you will take a moment to reflect on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I hope you will take this opportunity to also explore what our other justices, both those who are living and those who have gone on, are to our country. We've had very significant people in the past few decades who have helped to shape this country. One of the ones that I mentioned a moment ago, Antonin Scalia, is also worth researching. He was one of the leading conservative voices on the court. I disagreed with him a little more than I disagreed with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and yet I often found his arguments compelling and intellectually sound. And it was in the arguments between Scalia on the right and Ginsburg on the left that you often found the important middle ground that our country really needs in many of its facets. So again, I invite you to take a moment, as you'll probably see in news reports, online, as you'll hear on the radio, as hopefully you'll be reading in newspapers and magazines, as you'll see flags lowered to half-mast. I hope that you will see uh, a little bit more about her. And if you visit my Facebook page, you'll see this graphic up there. And I think this is one of the better quotes from her. Fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. I'll be back in just a moment for our lecture. Welcome to our lecture on chapters four and five in earth science. We're going to look at things like volcanoes and 
earthquakes. I didn't have a good picture of an earthquake to put up there. So we have volcanic eruptions. There are different types of volcanic eruptions and there are different types of earthquakes. We'll look at all of these things. These are chapters four and five in the earth science text. You have in your modules the PowerPoints for four and five. You should be able to find the answers to pretty much all the questions in quizzes four and five. Some are true and false, some are multiple choice in those PowerPoints or presented here in this lecture. Uh, remember, it is, however, open notes and open book and uh, everything else. And if you can't find a specific answer somewhere, that's what the internet was invented for. I don't mind your using that along the way. So without any further ado, uh, also let, just let me let you know, uh, each of these chapters would usually in class some, take somewhere around an hour to do a lecture. I'm not going to make you sit here through two hours of a Zoom lecture. So I'll, I'll be glossing over some of the material without a, a huge amount of detail. Uh, I will be putting up a couple of extra videos, one of which is already up in your module on how deep we can drill, how deep uh, things are on the crust of our planet. And I'll put up a couple of other videos as well that will be useful in terms of volcanoes and earthquakes uh, so that you can see a little bit there and not just listen to me. But let me find out again, sharing the screen. I want to share this one here. And let us view the slideshow. At first, we're going to look at plate tectonics. So this is mostly our section on earthquakes. Uh, plate tectonics is a relatively new idea in science. Uh, we had really un up until the 1800s, no idea that any of the plates, any of the continents moved around on, on our planet. Uh, in into the 1960s, we had uh, uh, just a limited idea about how such movements could be going around. Uh, so this is really revolutionary in, in, in many ways. Uh, Alfred Wegener was someone, uh, let me stop here for just Uh, again, sorry, there was a little bit of an interruption there, so hopefully this clip won't be too abrupt. Alfred Wegener, who was born in the late 1800s, first proposed the idea that the continents were separating by some really unknown mechanism. Uh, around 1915, by 1930, most geologists had rejected this, and uh, they thought that there was no way that this was ever happening along the way. Uh, he died in about 1930 as well, so he never got to live to see the fact that by the 1960s, everyone was signing on to this idea. Uh, this is not unusual in the history of science, that someone who has the right idea can have it rejected. And then decades later, sometimes centuries later, people say, oh, yeah, we should have been. Uh, Galileo is a case in point. But what is happening, essentially, as we understand it, is the movement of the plates which hold the continents and various other parts of the crust break apart and move back and forth with each other. We can actually see on the map how things seem to fit together. And as they break apart, they can create new crust that mostly happens in the ocean areas. And we uh, just a very few places where it's above ground, like Iceland. Hey, there's a reason why I go there a lot. This is one of the reasons. And um, we also have drift, continental drift. They're sort of like puzzle pieces floating away from each other sometimes uh, we, as we look at maps. Uh, when they were all together, uh, we had something called Pangea. And Wegener's original idea had these kinds of scrunchy uh, 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 placements of the different continents, including, as you see on the map, South America and Africa look like they fit together. Antarctica and Africa, Antarctica and South America have pieces that seem to fit together. North America, uh, the Appalachians, I may have mentioned this at another point earlier in, in our class, uh, 
came about because North America and the northern portion of Africa used to border each other and scrunched. And it's that scrunching that caused the mountains to buckle up. Uh, so, so we have, have this sort of interesting thing. Pan, Gia means all. Pan is in like Pan American uh, 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 idea. Uh, Gia as in geode, geology, uh, Gaia, uh, meaning all of the earth. Pretty much m most, not all, we have a few things that were separated out. But this wasn't the only supercontinent. These have been shifting and, and, and moving over and over and over again throughout the whole history of our planet. Our planet's four and a half billion years old. Uh, so this process has been going on for a very long time. It took at least half a billion years or so for the continents to actually form, for the Earth to cool off enough for that to happen. But when we're looking for different evidences of this, we see how rocks on both South America and Africa are similar, fossils are similar. We see various patterns of the, the geology and even patterns of the climates that fit each other along the way. We see in fossils, uh, there are fossils all over the world. But how do you end up with the same kinds of fossils in Australia, Antarctica, Africa, and South America if they were all always separate by the ocean and these are things that didn't swim? Well, when they were together, the continents were together, the animals would just breed and walk across. That's also true with plants. It's not just animals, it's also plant life. So we'll find things that are similar in both Africa and South America that could never make it across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you might have like pollen that floats in the air or even maybe birds, but when we're, we're talking sizable animals, that doesn't happen. That just doesn't happen along the way. As we are also looking at different parts of the world in terms of what they used to be climate-wise, we see large portions of Africa and India, both of which are now super hot near the equator, or covered with ice once upon a time. Well, that makes sense when they were all combined with Antarctica and mostly centered around the South Pole. In fact, there's one conjecture, and I will put up a video on this uh, in, in the modules. I'm gonna write it down right now so I don't forget it, uh, called Snowball Earth. Snowball Earth uh, hypothesis is that the entire surface of the planet and at least at one point, maybe several points in our history, covered over completely with ice and snow. Now it didn't freeze all the way solid down. We still had liquid oceans underneath, but as the plates broke up, it broke up too. So once again, climate change. Our climate has always been changing and different portions of our, uh, our uh, planet have also been changing in different ways. We have like here in North America, you see it where it says coal swamps. This area here used to be in a much, much more balmier te temperature. What is now considered to be northern New York, once upon a time, was right about the equator. That's going to make a very different environment. That's going to make for a very different uh, temperature range that's there. Then we see the way that earthquakes are shifting things around. We see the, the age and size of the seafloors. A lot of these things combine. So we have not just one piece of evidence. What we have when we're talking about the theory of plate tectonics are several different layers, no pun intended, of evidence that give us support for this theory along the way. Most of which Alfred Wegener honestly did not have. He didn't have the technological capacity to do a lot of these kinds of things. So we don't say that, oh, well, all those geologists in the 1930s, they were just stupid uh, for not understanding this. They were working with unsupported theories back then, which we now have uh, come around to seeing do deserve a lot of support. And this is part of what science does. It can sometimes validate old ideas that were rejected, and it can sometimes invalidate established rules that have been accepted for a very long time. So it pays as a scientist to not get too emotionally or personally involved in your ideas. That's easier said than done. Uh, when we're talking about our 
uh, uh, sort of top surface where we live, the plates that are moving around. We live on these plates that are moving. We live on the top of the lithosphere. Uh, remember during our uh, uh, rock, uh, our rock lab just last week, we were talking about lithic and uh, lithification, the solidification of things as part of the rock cycle. Uh, we have that at the top. We call that the lithosphere, the rigid part that we live on. And then we have the asthenosphere, uh, which is a weaker portion of the mantle. It's solid, but much more permeable because it's nearing melting. And, and we have the flows, especially flows of magma, large areas uh, that are moving uh, beneath that, but also parts of the asthenosphere are moving around as well. This area down here is what's moving and melting. And then we have our more solidified things nearer the top. Of course, they're what's cooling off. Uh, continental crust and our oceanic crust, both of which are older than the stuff down here. But the oceanic crust you see is thinner, tends to get recycled more than the continental crust. Continental crust will be older in general than the oceanic crust. And here we can see the major plates that are around. We have the South American plate and the African plate, which are pulling apart from each other. We have the Pacific plate, which is one of the larger plates on, on the planet, which is actually curving around. And as it curves around, it pulls in different directions. That's why part of California is going one way and part is going the other, while North America butts up against it because it's going in that way. Notice we've got lots of mountain ranges where those kinds of things are happening. Sometimes when, when things separate out, like the African plate and the South American plate or the African plate and the North American plate, it's creating this trench in the middle where stuff bubbles up and creates a ridge you would think that it would open up, but in fact, stuff is flowing up and then solidifying in, in the, the ocean floor itself. This goes almost all the way from the South Ocean, uh, the, the, the southern reaches of Antarctica, to the North Pole, not all the way exactly to the North Pole, but to the Arctic region. And it's all underwater except for one spot, this little spot right here that I'm circling with the arrow. What is that called? That's called Iceland. Again, that's why I go there, because you can actually step on the plate where, or the place where the plates are separating out. And you can go back year after year and see how much further they have separated. In other places where they're combining, we have one going under the other. The one going under is called subduction. The one that's being uplifted is usually a mountain range. And that's what's happening on the west coast of the entire Americas, actually. Uh, so we have that when that happens, that's called convergent. They're coming together. When we're having things separate out, that's where we have divergent. And when we're having this ridge formed underneath these separations out, we call this a transforming boundary. So we have divergent, convergent, and transforming. Uh, remember those three. So this sort of talks about what's happening. Divergent move away from each other. Convergent are moving towards each other. Uh, this is where we get lots of mountains and volcanoes in particular. And then we have the transforming plate boundaries where, where they're sort of not really bumping up against each other, but they're not quite pulling as far apart. And they're sort of moving towards around each other uh, a, a, along the way. So, so divergent, again, things move apart. As they move apart, the sea floor comes up from the stuff that's underneath that will then reform, and we have a thinner area. So, so we have uh, these upswells, and, and this, this is what makes sea floors newer and thinner. So those are things that are worth remembering here. What, what we have, of course, we can see here we get a separation that's going and going. Then we have sort of eventually two different continents that have separated out from one. That's what happened with South America and Africa. That's what happened with North America and Africa. It's weird to think about all the way from Florida up through Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, all of New England, all the way up to Maine, used to be attached to the portion of Africa where the Sahara Desert is today. I mean, it, it's, it's really interesting. And of course, we have this upswelling that forms 
the new ocean floor. And that's why it's much newer than the surrounding continents. Convergent plates, that's where we have one going under the other. We have the Sierra Nevada, the Cascade Mountains, Andes Mountains. Uh, we also have uh, the, the uh, Indian subcontinent. Sometimes it's called a subcontinent because it's sort of a part of a plate that's pushing itself up under the, 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 uh, the Asian plate, the Eurasian plate. So here's a good example. We have Mount Hood. Uh, we ha could have a picture of Mount St. Helens, which is a volcano. Remember, these tend to be volcanic activity areas as well as uh, earthquake areas. Washington, Oregon, California, earthquakes and volcanoes, because that's where one of the plates is going under the other. This will also start recycling things. We talked about that in an earlier chapter. So then we have our convergent ones. We will often have uh, 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 volcanoes forming on the ocean floors as well. And sometimes we'll have island changes. The Aleutian Islands are a bunch of volcanoes, like the one I've got behind me here, that are sort of forming out of the sea as two portions of the seafloor are moving past each other along the way. So, so here we sort of have that one is sort of buckling up under the other as it's moving, as, as, as the Pacific plate is turning around. Uh, here we have uh, 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 mountain ranges such as the Himalayas as well, which is where, again, the India subplate, as I, as I mentioned, is sort of going, 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 and, and it used to be sort of a separate thing, and it's just pushing itself, and as it pushes itself under the plate, it pushes the rest of the mountains up and up and up. That's why this area up here in the top of India, which is to, today Tibet, part of China, is so much different from the rest because you can see exactly where the ridge is. You can see exactly where the, the shift is along the way. And that will continue to happen. Uh, it, it will so, sort of slow and be less and less and less as that happens. Here's a satellite photo and you can see exactly what I mean. Uh, you can see where the India subplate is. You can see all this white stuff. This is snow, snow-capped mountains. And these are a mile or more up at a minimum, and some of these are five miles and higher, Mount Everest, for example, and K2 and others are five miles above sea level because the India plate is pushing them up. But there's an upper limit to just how high they can go before gravity will pull them back down. Uh, but because of this, all of this stuff here, all of this ice and snow as it melts, runs off into river streams and it runs off into big rivers in China over in this area. It runs off into a big river down here in Southeast Asia, and it runs off into several big rivers, including the Indies, Indus and the Ganges and uh, other rivers into India. Three billion people on our planet get their water from the Himalayas, from the, the runoff from this ice and snow here because ice and snow melts into fresh water. And you can see in, the, in the, the satellite photos here, notice this patch here and notice these lighter patches here. This is where the rivers are really forcing water into the oceans and it's changing around the local areas, uh, the nature of the, the, the ocean uh, around the old city of Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City in uh, Vietnam, the Mekong, river would push the water so fast and so with so much force that you could be 30, 40, 50 miles off the coast and it could still be mostly fresh water if you scooped up a water, uh, a, a, a glass of water in, in your cup from your boat. Uh, that doesn't happen quite as much now. Why? Because they've dammed it and they're stopping the water before it gets down there. It's changing the environment as it does that along the way. So. Then we have our transforming. No new crust is made here, but we often have uh, ridges that are forming, including the main one that's going on right now between uh, the North and South American plates and the Africa and Eurasian plates here. Uh, so, so we don't really have quite the same kind of separation anymore. It used to be separation kind of things, but it sort of slowed in that regard because the South American plate and the North American plates are now bumping up against 
the Pacific and Nazca plates that are that are not allowing it to go too much further along the way. Meanwhile, there's still movement taking place. So we call them fracture zones, and the fracture zones are there. Then we have the Red Sea and the Arabian Peninsula. We can sort of see those pulling apart because even though Africa is going in that general direction, it's sort of tilting as it's going in that direction. The Arabian Peninsula as part of the Eurasian plate is moving away from it. So the Red Sea is getting wider and wider. So this is caused by the separation here. Uh, this is interesting because if you remember the biblical story about people walking across on dry land, uh, when you've got tsunamis and when you've got earthquakes, which you're going to have in this kind of rift zone, when you have volcanoes, which you have in this kind of rift zone, you might have times when the water recedes and then the water rushes back. There's a historic memory that's being played out in those kinds of stories that are there, including Sodom and Gomorrah. It's destroyed by uh, uh, fire and brimstone. What is fire and brimstone? What am I sitting in front of a picture of? Sort of looks like fire and brimstone. Guess what? It's in a volcanic zone. They're remembering those kinds of stories. I don't know whether it's divine judgment uh, in, in quite the way that the, the text might think about it trying to be, but it certainly matches the geology there. Then here we have the San Andreas Fault, which is one of the sort of the, the shifting areas in California. Uh, when we're when we're registering California earthquakes, this is one of the primary areas where it takes place. Uh, plates and plate boundaries change. The the outlines of continents will change. The ocean sizes, the ocean uh, 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 shapes will change, and they continue to move. In fact, all GPS satellites are keyed to things that are on the ground and keep track of the movements that are taking place. If you had to guess how many earthquakes there are every day in the planet, uh, and I said, well, there are 10, you might say, okay, and then you might say there are 100, and you might say, well, okay, and I might say there are 1,000, and you might say, okay, we're not even close. We're getting up into the thousands and thousands. Most of them are too gentle for us to really register if we were standing there, but we have them all the time, and we have them here in Indiana, too. I felt I've, I've actually felt sort of standing or sitting somewhere. I felt them happen and they've been strong enough for things to fall down in different places. But most earthquakes that get registered on our planet are actually not that significant. Here we can see the breakup of Pangaea and we call this a supercontinent. Uh, lots of continents grouped together uh, like this. It wasn't the first supercontinent. It's actually the latest supercontinent. There were several other before, but we can sort of see it goes from the Triassic period uh, uh, down into a sort of gentle separation of North America and Eurasia. It's beginning to slip apart. Notice Africa and Asia. Asia's up here and Africa's here. And now they're sort of collapsing together uh, as, as we go through time here. So eventually that's going to push itself completely into each other uh, and the Mediterranean may completely disappear uh, over time. But, but we have lots of different things that are happening here. Notice India, this little piece here by the A in Pangaea. India separates off from Antarctica. It used to be near the South Pole and is near, now nearly halfway up the, north, the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so, so things change, things change. Uh, ocean drilling gives us some uh, sort of core samples. We can sort of look and look and look, just like we're looking at the Grand Canyon, where we can see the different levels, the striations. We can do that with a core. We pull it up and we can sort of see the different, different layers of sediments and, and structures in the geology that's there. So deep sea drilling has been of great help. There are some areas where you drill and some you don't. You don't want to drill in, in this kind of uh, uh, hot zone here because your stuff will melt. And if you watch the video I've already put up on how far down we can drill, you can see some of the things that we've drilled down to. We can't go any further where they're drilling because it's too close to the hot zones and everything melts when you're trying to drill any further down than that. We also have mantle plumes and hot spots. 
And one of the things that happens with a hot spot is if it sort of sits there, it just builds up and builds up and builds up, the best known of which is in Hawaii. Uh, what's happening in Hawaii, notice we've got all these different islands here, but it's, it's not just these few islands. We've, we've got um, uh, sort of a, a half a dozen main islands in Hawaii and several more smaller islands and then uh, island islets around. But what's happening is there's a hot spot. We have what's called a rising mantle plume here that gives us a hot spot. And the plate itself is moving. So the hot spot stays there, but the plate moves and it builds an island and then the plate moves and then it builds an island there and then the plate moves and it builds an island there. So you just have almost like a conveyor belt. It's building one and that moves over and it's building one and that moves over and it's building one and that moves over. And, and you can sort of see all there's this huge mountain range underneath the Pacific Ocean because what the Hawaiian islands are, are mountaintops. The biggest mountain on the planet is not Mount Everest. The biggest island on the planet is actually this big island of Hawaii. It's just most of it is underwater. But if you're measuring from the base to the top and the size of it, it wins. Hawaii wins. Why is this so big and the others are smaller? It's because the plate sort of stopped moving for a while and now it's stayed there so it's built up and built up and built up. Now the hot spots actually shifted so that the next Hawaiian island is already in the stages of forming. Loihi, they've already named it. Loihi, it's there. But you can see all of these other islands that failed. We had this huge long chain and then it stopped for a while and we got one top of the mountain. This is the top of the mountain sticking above the ocean here. And then it moved rather rapidly, so we didn't get any that were there. And then it slowed and slowed and then really slowed. And here we can see Loihi, which is about to form in about a million years. So get your condo reservations now. So trust me on that. It, 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 it's a hot property. Ah, hot property. Yes, I know, bad jokes. We'll keep going. Uh, there are also things that tell us thing, uh, about the magnetism in what's preserved in the rocks. Some rocks are magnetic, metallic uh, 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 metal or metallic minerals often will have a magnetism about them. And what's happening as the magma flows up, the lava cools, if it has these kinds of minerals in them. As it cools, it'll give us a sort of a north-south orientation to the magnetism. Well, sometimes that's in different directions. So, okay, why is it this way rather than this way? Well, when it formed and solidified, the continents were shifted in a different direction. It also gives us an indication that sometimes north and south flip. We have those as magnetic field reversals. That's not unusual. The sun actually does that every 11 years on a regular basis. Our planet does it on a much less regular basis and it's not even regular, uh, it's, it's irregular. But we can see recorded in the magnetism in rocks that this has happened along the way. Our polar path has shifted both in terms of what our actual North Pole is as well as what our magnetic pole is relative to both the continents and the magnetism of the planet. And we can, uh, and our magnetic pole continues to shift around in the Northern Hemisphere along the way because we're sloshing in the middle. Uh, so so we, can, we can see going back millions of years uh, where we have the, the uh, polar wandering uh, for, for the different, different continents as well as our, our magnetism shifts there. So time scales, We've got these different time scales that are here. I'm not going to have you worry too much about that. Uh, when we're doing uh, MYA, we're sort of talking millions of years here. Uh, so, so this is a very, very slow process. Uh, plate motion can be measured, as I mentioned before, by a GPS. It can be measured by what's called very long baseline interferometry. Uh, which is another thing that is often used in astronomy as well as uh, geological surveys like this as well, where, where you're, you're really taking the entire planet or much of the planet into 
your scope of measurement at the same time. But we also have different direct measurements from things that we have directly observed in terms of either C core samples or other things that have been done that way. Here you can see the arrows of movement. We have a, a push on one side and a pull on the other side uh, of South America. So we've got the buckling with the Andes Mountains uh, there. Then we also have the North American plate, which is shifting here. While it's shifting in that direction, the Pacific plate is also turning, but turning at a different rate in that same general direction. Uh, and then we have a tiny little plate, almost a platelet, uh, up here in, in, in the area between uh, what, what I'd say Oregon to uh, British Columbia, the southern tip of Alaska here. This gives us a much more active volcanic zone more volcanoes in this area than say down here in, in California. Then we also have the Philippine plate, uh, which, is, which extends up into uh, the, the uh, sort of area just under Japan. And we also have uh, the, the plate that is moving again against the Eurasian plate over here against Japan. Guess what? Lots of earthquakes, volcanoes, Mount Fuji in Japan. Uh, so, so we have quite a number of things happening there. Then we also have this, the, the Eurasian plate and the Africa plate. Well, guess what? We've got Mount Vesuvius right in here. Uh, we also have the Arabian plate, which is a little bit separate, and the, uh, the India plate, which is shoving itself up under the Eurasian plate, giving us the huge mountain range. So we've got some really big plates, some smaller fractures of plates that, that are around. And things are moving. Five centimeters a year doesn't sound like much. We're talking a couple of inches, but you know, a couple of inches, year after year after year after year. I went up here, see, this is the Reykjanes Ridge, which is where things are separating in Iceland. When I first went there, when I was a child, I put one foot in North America and one foot in Eurasia, in Europe. And I went back the next year, I went back the next year, I went back the next year, and I went back the next year. I can't put my feet in the same places where I put them 45, 50 years ago. Now, I can't stretch that far anymore. That's how far in one lifetime things have separated out. Uh, imagine doing that over hundreds of years. Things change, things change quite a bit. So what happens to do all this? Well, we don't have a complete model yet. We've only been working on it really since the 1960s when people said, hey, yeah, that Wegener guy, he may have had, a, uh, had an insight there. But we do have convection bubbles in terms of the hot stuff underneath when we're, when we're sort of talking about the magma and the other heated parts of, of the mantle under the crust. Uh, we also have different parts that gets pulled. Sometimes when we got our convergent zones here, stuff is being pulled. We've got things that are separating out, which are giving things a push. So we've got push-pull different things happening in addition to gravity, which works in different ways. So we end up with trenches and we end up with ridges. Oddly enough, you might think this would be a, a trench where things are separating out, but that's where the stuff is coming up and forming a new ridge. So it's almost counterintuitive. We've got different models that have been proposed. I'll invite you to sort of look online to talk about layer cake modeling, uh, especially if you're doing anything in culinary. Hey, that could be a final project in a class someday. Uh, whole mantle convection, where we've got stuff that, that is pretty consistent around the planet. Truth is, we honestly don't know. We, 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 we are still in early days in terms of trying to figure out all the stuff that's happening in the core and in the mantle. So we have different models that are possible for movement. And is the movement all the way through the mantle or is the movement mostly confined to the upper mantle that's just underneath the crust and the lithosphere? The honest truth is we don't know, we don't know. But one of the things that helps us is earthquakes because earthquakes, you never think of earthquakes as being helpful, right? But what earthquakes will do is they will send out waves that can be registered almost everywhere on the planet. 
because they just go through and just like the ripples in a pond, if I drop a pebble here, the, the waves by the time they reach the, the edges of the pond will be much smaller, but they'll still be there. And if you've got sensitive enough equipment, you can, you can measure it. And that's one of the things that happens in terms of uh, uh, earthquakes along the way. We will have a, a, an, an epicenter, which is the surface area above where the hypocenter, which is where the real mm. rumble is taking place. So the epicenter is actually not where the power is. It's the surface indicator of where underneath the real power is happening, the, 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 the shaky spot that's happening along the way. But these movements are explained by plate tectonics technologies. Uh, we have rocks that are elastic. We sort of talked about that. If they move too sharply, they'll break. But if you have just enough pressure for just a long enough period of time, they can move back and forth. And sometimes we have rocks that are sort of moving but then come back together. We have manufactured metals that do that quite readily. Uh, but the natural things will do that as well. So we have what's called a uh, sort of natural rebound, an elastic rebound. Uh, if you put too much force on things, they just snap and break. Uh, but if you, if you don't put too much force, it moves, but then it goes back. And that is sometimes what will happen in terms of the, the, the stuff as it heats and cools, as it's pushed and pulled in other direction, all of these forces are at work. We have earthquakes that will sometimes have foreshocks. You'll have sort of mild rumblings before you have major, uh, 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 I was about to say eruptions, but major uh, uh, quake forces. Sometimes you'll have eruptions because sometimes you'll have uh, volcanoes and earthquakes uh, simultaneously. Then we're, we're all used to aftershocks, the sort of the minor tremors uh, that happen after that. But foreshocks we're not as used to. Uh, again, go to Iceland, they're used to that because, they, and, and telling the difference between an earthquake without a volcano and an earthquake with a volcano, uh, that's actually one of the places best equipped in the world. Uh, Japan is another great place uh, for that. Italy is another great place. You have major, major work done in all of these three places on earthquakes and volcanoes and how they're tied together with each other, but also uh, sort of uh, being able to register from the foreshocks whether a or not a major quake is on the way. Uh, or uh, you might consider them sort of almost like a pregnancy. Uh, if, if any of you have been pregnant or have, have been with someone who, who is pregnant, you know, you get the, the, the sort of the false labor of Braxton Hicks, uh, Higgs uh, and, and um, other kinds of, uh, of things that it's like, oh, is it happening? No, it's not happening yet. Uh, that we're, we're trying to figure that out in terms of the, the, the uh, uh, movements of the planet along the way. So we have earthquakes, mostly large earthquakes associated with plate boundaries. Uh, divergent ones produce smaller ones. Uh, smaller earthquakes, convergent ones will produce some of the larger ones. Uh, and, and then the transforming boundaries can produce them anywhere along the way. Uh, so as we're sort of looking at one plate going under the other, oh, hey, California, there are some major earthquakes that are going on there. Uh, as we're sort of looking at that also happening in Japan and the Pacific plate, hey, there are lots of stuff happening there. No, lots of major earthquakes in Hawaii. Why? Because there's no major, major plate movement there. There's volcanic movement there, so you might get some associated with the volcanoes, uh, but you don't get these kinds of earthquakes that are happening there. So these sort of mega thrust faults, as the name would imply, uh, we're getting quite a bit of power that's there. You, you get the, the compressional stress from one, say the Rocky Mountains are being compressed up, all the mountains on the west coast are being compressed up, the Pacific plate is going in the other direction and it's going underneath the American plate. So we've got the overriding plate, and we've got the thrusts up, and we've got the subducting plate, and we've got the, the force of the ocean going in that direction. And you've just got so many forces that are acting here uh, that this creates a very active zone in terms of earthquakes. We study earthquake waves because 
that's, that's what they are, just like waves in a pond. And we call it seismology, a study of earthquake waves. A seismograph is what we use, a seismogram, seismograph. When I, when I learned it, it was a seismograph. Now they're calling it a seismogram. I will take either one, uh, to be honest. Uh, and and uh, this is what you do to record the movements of the Earth. Essentially what you do is you have sensors all over the place, and as the sensors are moving, you record the movement of the sensors along the way. Uh, but, but you need to position them in such a way that miscellaneous truck that goes down the road isn't going to rumble the road and therefore you get thrown off and think it's an earthquake when it's not. The earthquake that I experienced, I want to say 10 or 12 years ago, I was living in Ellettsville at the time. I had a house in Ellettsville. Uh, I had a weird life. I had three houses at once. Uh, my house in Ellettsville, I was on the sofa. I was dozing off a little bit, and I heard a noise, and the whole house shook. Now, I lived down a hill that always developed a pothole because the water ran down the hill and created a pothole every single year. And whenever a car or truck with a trailer, especially, would hit that pothole, it would make a loud noise, and sometimes it would even rattle like the windows in the front. So that's what I thought had happened, that something in particular, uh, particularly large, had hit the pothole and rattled the house. Found out later that day it was an earthquake that was centered close to Evansville and had shook my house all the way up near Ellettsville. So, so these things happen here, even in Indiana. But the way we register those things is we have uh, typically devices that will be embedded in the bedrock. You want to get it onto something that is really solid on the earth and not going to be measured, uh, measuring some other kind of movement like a landslide or a mudslide or just even subsidence. Uh, uh, and and that, that can be a little bit tricky to determine. We have uh, two different types of waves. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, the, we have primary waves and secondary waves or sinusoidal waves. Primary waves are compressional. They sort of move back and forth. So you can guard against those in architectural design a lot. Uh, they, they, these will go through solids, liquids, and gas. Uh, and they move the fastest. Fortunately, they are the, not the most destructive, though, even though they have the greatest velocity. Because again, if I design something that's solid and you sort of shake it, it's shaking, but it's solid. Uh, it, the S waves, uh, the, the sinusoidal waves, uh, the secondary waves that become an issue. If you've ever seen a video of a bridge that's sort of doing the wave kind of thing, well, when you're putting those kinds of torques and stresses on building materials or rocks or anything else, they're much more likely to crumble and break. Uh, fortunately, the secondary waves tend to be blocked by solids more readily, and they don't tend to travel through uh, 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 liquids and, and gas. So, so they, will, they will have less of an outcropping in terms of any force. So you need to be pretty close to it, but sometimes you can be close to it and that will, will do things. So as we're looking at the earthquakes, we have our first waves that sort of come through, which will be pressure waves typically. Then we'll have our first S waves, our secondary waves. Uh, frequently we're going to have an interval of several minutes between the first pressure waves and the and the first uh, sort of the sort of all all the wiggly kinds of waves uh, that are going to be there. So you can get a little bit of advance warning, but not a lot, uh, not a lot. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, tidal waves and things like that, you can sometimes get hours and hours ahead of time. Earthquakes, not so much, uh, because we still haven't figured out quite how to predict, especially in terms of the intensity, what's going to be happening there. So when you're looking for the epicenter, where did this actually start? You really need to have three, at a minimum, different stations so you can sort of triangulate. Uh, three, try. Uh, and, and, and what you'll do is you'll sort of figure out how long it took to get to one, how long it took to get to the other, how long it took to get to the third, and you will then be able to focus where it happened. You'll be able to pick an epicenter in terms of the surface, and then you can do other measurements to figure out how far down 
it is along the way. So here is three seismograms uh, that, that, that are sort of registering. And we can see we've got a longer period of time here, a shorter period of time here that matches the time that's here. Many of these waves, especially the P waves, will actually go through the entire planet. It will be less and less and less as it goes through the entire planet. But we can register things, we can register earthquakes in California in Cambridge, England. They've got the equipment there, they can do it. We can register here in Indiana, the Indiana Geological Survey has the equipment here in Bloomington to measure earthquakes on the entire planet all the way along. So as we're looking for that, let's see we're registering things in Mexico City, we're registering things in Nome, Alaska, we're measuring things in New York. Well, you sort of just span, expand your circles and ta-da, there you go. In this map, it looks like it would be somewhere around Salt Lake City. Uh, not as probable, but that's just an example. Uh, intensity, of course, we, we have uh, uh, some that are stronger, some that are larger. We are mostly using now the modified Mercalli intensity scale. If you watch Hollywood, it's always the Richter scale. Uh, but here, here we are uh, for not felt unless you're standing right on the epicenter uh, kind of thing. Uh, you can actually feel earthquakes on upper floors better than lower floors of buildings. So if you ever get a chance to live in the penthouse, just beware that little swaying that's happening sometimes can be an earthquake. Sometimes it can be the atmosphere as well. You gotta get used to being ever so slightly seasick in some of those taller buildings uh, along the way. But uh, number four here, this is what I felt when I was in my house in Ellettsville. During the day, felt indoors by many, outdoors by few, sensation like a heavy truck striking a building. Mine was like a heavy truck striking the pothole that was out there along the way. And then we can go all the way down into 12. Damage total, waves seen on ground surfaces. In other words, you can like, like watch that action taking place. Objects are literally thrown up into the air because the pressure that's happening uh, that, that, that's there. So that's what you usually see in Hollywood movies, depictions of earthquakes. Uh, we, we measure magnitudes on the Richter scale. Uh, see, the, the, the intensity, they will sort of throw intensity and magnitude for Hollywood purposes together. Intensity is different from magnitude. Uh, but, but when we're dealing with this, we go sort of like one, two, three. From an earthquake one to an earthquake two, it's 10 times as much. To a three, it's a hundred times as much because it's ten times ten times ten. Uh, so, so, so when we're we're sort of dealing with that in terms of the wave amplitude, uh, but that works out to being thirty-two times more energy being released there. So uh, that that's that's quite a dramatic difference between a two and a three and a four along the way. But the problem is by the time we get up to the major quakes, it's, it's sort of like having an IQ over 160, almost impossible to measure adequately after certain levels. Uh, so as we can sort of see, difference in magnitude, the difference in ground motion goes way up, difference in energy, way, 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 way up all, all along the way. Uh, so, so yeah, just one point over here can make all the difference literally in the world, as you see there. Uh, when, when we're dealing with magnitude, uh, it can be derived in part from the strengths of the rocks and the amount of the slip of the fault uh, that's taking place. Uh, so, so these are, are uh, some of the ways in which we will measure the stuff that's happening there. And when we're dealing with our magnitudes, we have very minor earthquakes. Notice when it says average per year, minor earthquakes down here, 1,300,000 per year. That means we're talking thousands and thousands per day because there are only 365 days in a year. So that's a lot of earthquakes. But again, when we're down here in this area, hardly anyone notices. And even though I heard the earthquake and it rumbled my house. There was no damage at all. So it would have been in this range here. I think they actually said it was around a three. Uh, so it was very, it was felt by humans, felt by me, uh, and, and the very light damage, nothing in my area. 
Uh, and, and then of course we can see, we get up into our, our scales of seven and eight and the largest ones ever recorded, as you notice are sort of, sort of uh, fairly recent. It's not that we haven't had major ones in the past, it's that we didn't have the equipment. And when we're looking at older geological evidence, it's, we're, we're guessing. We can have educated guesses, but we're still guessing. So we don't tend to look back and say, oh, that was the largest one ever, because there are lots of different factors that we, we put into play there. You may occasionally hear here in Indiana, uh, the speculation that the most powerful earthquake to ever hit North America was here in Indiana in the New Madrid Fault, or New Madrid Fault. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the, again, it depends on a lot of different measurements, but one of the key things is it didn't cause a lot of damage to life and economic whatever because there wasn't any economic whatever at that time. Uh, there may have been some things in Native American economies, but they didn't tend to build up the way Western societies did. So they wouldn't have had skyscrapers collapsing and, and people dying and other kinds of things like that. Chances are good, loss of life, loss of uh, in anything in a real economic sense was fairly minor, even if it was a major powerful quake along the way. Uh, so, so fortunately, we tend to have these huge ones uh, fairly rarely, fairly rarely. When we're doing uh, sort of an analysis of how damaging they can be, uh, this is where if you're, if you're going into business, if you're going into the insurance business, for example, if you're going into construction businesses, for example, if you're going into any number of different kinds of businesses uh, that need to take into account the environment. This is part of the environment, earthquakes. Uh, how are you going to measure the kinds of damage that's happening there? How do you do the cost benefit analysis of whether or not the building that you're building needs to withstand an earthquake? See again, if you look at San Francisco, and if you look at Iceland, and you look at a place like Haiti, each of those three places has a strong propensity for earthquakes. When there was a same power earthquake in San Francisco and Iceland and Haiti, San Francisco and Iceland, Iceland had virtually no death. San Francisco had a few people die. Haiti had thousands of people die. Why? Because the building standards in Haiti were not built to stand up to an earthquake. The earth quaked and most of the buildings in Port-au-Prince seemed to collapse especially in the poorer districts of town. Whereas even in the portions of the city where things became unlivable in San Francisco, the people themselves were able to get out and things were able to be rebuilt later. I had a friend who was actually in the stadium during the World Series when there was a major earthquake in San Francisco. Guess what? They didn't play the game that night. You can't blame them. But there was, and, and there was major structural damage around the city. Not a lot of loss of life, not a lot of injuries either uh, for such a major quake. And life got back to normal fairly quickly. In Port-au-Prince, it took a decade and a half before things became even halfway similar to that. And one of the reasons I remember that so well, a friend of mine owns a company that builds church organs and his company was hired to rebuild the cathedral organ in Port-au-Prince because the church had collapsed. So it, there, there, there are different things that come into play in terms of structural damage. We can have the ground shaking, just sort of back and forth. We can have the wave amplification. We can have the, the sinusoidal waves. We can also have liquefaction which means you can have so much energy happening that the, 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 the ground on which the stuff is built literally crumbles and act, turns to a fluid-like substance, maybe even fluid, although it won't re-solidify rather quickly along the way. And then we have underground objects that might actually float up, including rocks and other things that can just literally bump buildings out of the way. Here, we can see in earth, uh, an earthquake damage 
uh, these buildings, some tilted. We have now the leaning towers of apartments here. This one fell over completely along the way. You would have thought, I would have thought in Japan, they would have built stronger than this, knowing already their history with earthquakes. You can be sure, reasonably sure, uh, that these kinds of, of buildings would not be built again uh, in, in Japan. But what happened here was, was the buildings themselves, as you can see, were sturdy enough, but the ground on which they were built essentially melted underneath. That's what, you, when you go from solid to liquid, it's melting, the liquefaction. They just sort of, okay, think about building something. Let's say you have a tub of ice cream and you build a little ice cream castle on the top or you have an ice sculpture and you set it on top, but the ice cream begins to melt, what happens to the sculpture? Well, it might be melting a little too, but it's probably melting less quickly than the base that it's on and it sort of slumps over. Uh, so this is not actually the issue with the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Then we have destruction. Of course, we have uh, landslides that can happen because of the, the weakened uh, uh, surfaces. Uh, we have fires that can break out both naturally as well as power plants are, are damaged, gas lines are damaged, all sorts of things. And then, of course, tsunamis. If you have earthquakes in the oceans, and that happens a lot, uh, remember all those fault lines that we saw are, are all over the oceans, then what it will do is it will sort of shift the water and will create waves that can literally go all the way across the ocean. So we do have strong tsunami warning systems especially in the Pacific area, also in the India, uh, Indian Ocean area. Uh, uh, not nearly as much in the Atlantic area, but there's not nearly as much uh, a threat there, but there is in, in large portions of the Atlantic too, but definitely the Pacific uh, area as well. So, so yes to tsunami warnings, no to earthquake warning systems. So remember that, uh, that will be important on your quiz. Here we can sort of see uh, a slide, uh, all of this stuff, uh, uh, this turn again heights that had been built up and we had cracks that had developed in the buildup. And so as things began to shake, the whole thing just collapsed and slid. And all these houses and all these developments just sort of, whoop, you can see the photo that's here. And it looks like they took the photo at an angle but that's not an angle. That's what happened. That the, the, the world was tilted along the way. Uh, here, here's part of the way in which a tsunami is created. We have before the earthquake, we have an earthquake that happens here. The subducting plate is going underneath. It's sort of pushing up a little bit. Uh, we, we have the sort of push up in the water and the tsunami goes really in a circle all the way around the ocean. Notice as it gets closer and closer to the shoreline, we have higher and higher waves that are forming and bigger and bigger troughs. We have the crest at the top of the wave, the trough at the bottom of the wave. And so we have a higher and higher thing. But notice sort of here near the coast here, there's going to be a time where all the water might actually be pulled away from the coast. Not for very long, usually only for at, at most a couple of minutes, but then it all comes sloshing back down. And that's happened in a number of places, including a place called Bande Aceh in Indonesia. So most of the energy from earthquakes comes from very narrow portions of our planet, uh, but all plate boundaries can produce earthquakes. Uh, so we do have uh, belt areas. Uh, here we can sort of see the Alpine Himalayan belt, where we have the Africa plate, the Arabian subplate, the Indian subcontinent plate, all bumping up against uh, this. We have mountain ranges that are there, including our tsunami area down here. This is where Bande Aceh was, is still, actually. And then notice all of these earthquakes, especially Japan over here, in through the Philippines. There are earthquakes and volcanoes there. There are earthquakes and volcanoes there. There are earthquakes and volcanoes here. Uh, so, so we've got quite a number of things uh, that, that are happening here. Where I used to live in the Philippines doesn't exist anymore because Mount Pinatubo looked like that. And uh, Clark Air Force Base and, and uh, uh, Subic uh, Bay 
uh, Navy base, uh, both of which had been closed uh, by, by that time or were in the process of closing when, when, it, it, when Pinatubo really erupted and did a lot of damage and they're all, well, that, that's gone, uh, that, that's gone there. Uh, this, this is the area, this is the area uh, that's there. So, and you can see there are little bits, tiny bits here in, in the Hawaiian Islands, but those are going to be mostly due again to the volcanic activity uh, that's in there. We don't, have, we don't have the major plate kinds of stuff. So, so a relatively minor stuff uh, happening there. So we don't have any reliable methods in terms of our short-term predictions, like there's going to be one tomorrow. There's going to be weather predictions are, are just flawless compared to earthquake predictions. And you know how funky uh, uh, weather predictions can be. I was going to say flunky. They can be flunky too. Uh, but but uh, funky, I think, is a word uh, there. In terms of long range, however, we know there's going to be a big earthquake that hits California sometime. And we can even tell pretty much where things are likely to happen in the long run, largely because we know what's happened before and we can see what's continuing to happen with the different plate tectonics. So this is uh, looking at things that have happened in the past helps us to know what will happen in the future, although it won't tell us when and won't tell us oh, the big one's coming uh, kind of thing. This is called paleo seismology. Paleo means we're looking back into prehistory. Prehistory essentially means before anyone was writing anything down. So prehistory can be prehistoric in different places at different times. Stonehenge is prehistoric in England, even though people in Egypt and people in what's today Iraq, uh, in, in places like Ur and Akkad and Babylon were writing. No one was writing in England at that time. So Stonehenge is prehistoric at the same time things were not prehistoric in Egypt. Uh, but as we're looking, especially at, say the New Madrid Fault, that's going to be prehistoric. No one was writing that stuff down when we had these kinds of shiftings take place. So how do we minimize the hazards? Well, we build strongly, just like again, San Francisco, Reykjavik, Iceland. You build buildings that aren't going to collapse like in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, you also look for warning systems that can measure the P waves, but that again only gives you a couple of minutes. It doesn't give you hours, doesn't give you days. It just gives you a couple of minutes. Uh, so we're, we're still working on mapping P waves, pressure waves, and S waves, secondary waves, shock waves, sinusoidal waves. I'll take any of those, those words uh, as, as they come through the interior. And you can take a trip over to the Indiana Geological Survey sometime, and they might show you some of their equipment that's there. Notice how things happen. We can then tell what's happening inside of our planet by the way waves are reflected uh, because they'll be reflected more directly by the, so the more solid material in our core or by the denser liquid but still core material inside here. Sometimes it will refract a wave, just like if a wave goes through a glass of water, a wave of light, or goes through a lens or like a prism, it will refract. We can tell that we also have diffraction happening. Uh, so we can look inside our planet thanks to earthquakes. And that tells us our structures. We've got a solid inner core. We've got an outer liquid core. They're mostly iron. And then we've got a mantle, lots of silicate, lots of oxygen. Remember, oxygen was one of our answers on one of the quizzes earlier. Uh, and and we've, got, we've got lots of high pressure. The further down you go, the more and more pressurized it is. It's not just denser material, but it's also under a lot more pressure. The higher you get, our ethnosphere tends to be rather weak compared to the other stuff. But then we get a stronger layer on top because it's solidified. It has undergone lithification. It is our lithosphere uh, that's, that's there. And then this, this video here, this link down here, is one that I have already posted up in your modules. And it looks at the deepest hole ever created, uh, the, the Kola's drill here. We've actually gone just a little bit further down 
uh, with uh, oil piping. Uh, but uh, this, this is sort of uh, interesting uh, to, to note because it finally was halted along the way because it was too hot melting everything as it was going down. So the, the deepest we've gone down in terms of drilling holes is only seven and a half miles, uh, two and a quarter kilometer or 12 and a quarter kilometers down. Uh, so, so it's, and, and it's only like, well, maybe more like that. Uh, but, it, but yeah, it's not one that you can even go down yourself. You, you can sort of barely fit uh, like a two liter of Coke all the way down and back again, not that you'd want to. Um, but, but if you watch this video, it's only three minutes long. In fact, it's a little less than three minutes long. No one's shouting out at you, sorry, uh, in, in, in this one. But it shows you how far down we like bury bodies in a cemetery, how far down an Olympic swimming pool would be below that. I mean, imagine that next time you go swimming in an Olympic swimming pool, if you go down to the bottom of that pool, you're now deeper than the average coffins in a cemetery. That's a rather spooky thought to think about. Uh, but then if you go in subways and you go in train tunnels and other kinds of things, especially in Europe and Japan, you can be going really, really deep. But really, really deep isn't actually that deep compared to the rest of the planet. Uh, because when we're dealing with a mile, it's 5,280 feet. When we're dealing with seven and a half miles there, we're talking 35 to 40,000 feet, give or take. When we're talking getting to the middle of the planet, we're talking like 21 million feet. So it, it, it's quite a ways off. So, okay, well, there it is for our uh, lecture for chapters four and five. I will post up one shortly on six and seven. Thanks for your attention.